Hello and welcome to today's webinar, Monitoring Docker Containers in a DevOps Context. Today's event brought to us by Sumo Logic and presented by Slashdot Media. This is Michael Krieger, and DevOps teams are challenged with monitoring, tracking, and troubleshooting issues in a context where continuous integration servers and DevOps tools emit their own logging data. Machine data can come from numerous sources, and CD tools may not agree on a common method. Once log data has been acquired, assembling meaningful real-time metrics, such as the condition of your host environment, the number of running containers, CPU usage, memory consumption, and network performance can all be challenging, and that's what we're going to talk about today. Very fortunate to have with us Chris Riley from uh, Fixate IO and Faisal Putuparakat from Druval. Before we get going, let me tell you a little bit about our speakers. Chris is a DevOps analyst with Fixate IO, where he works with companies to optimize their go-to-market content and growth hacking strategies. He's also a prolific author of blogs and white papers who writes and speaks on how to adopt cutting-edge technologies to improve development and IT operation, optimize processes, and become more competitive. Faisal is a senior engineer for data protection company Druva, where he holds a patent for a distributed, scalable, deduplicated data backup system. He was employee number five at Druva when he joined back in 2008. He's currently employed as a principal engineer, where for the past year he has donned a DevOps hat and successfully transitioned their production cloud on AWS to a Docker environment. We've got a lot of information to cover. I'll turn it over to our first presenter, Chris Riley. Chris, go ahead. Great. Thanks, Michael. So I, I'm very excited to be here today and, and talk about um, something that I'm very passionate about, which is how do you make sure that you can adopt this great thing we call Docker in a very constructive and sustainable way? Because in the scenarios that I've um, encountered so far, that is not the most common case. Uh, and and Part of the way of doing that is making sure that you have a robust method for logging. So first, we have to do just a standard definition of what we're talking about. Container technology is obviously dominated by one particular tool called Docker, but it's not the only tool. Um, it certainly has a lot of elements that um, make it a lot easier for development teams to use container technology. But containers aren't necessarily new. The technology might be new, but the concept of what we want to do is not really new. We've always kind of had this idea of treating applications as the entire stack and finding a way to deploy applications in a more repeatable and consistable, consistent way. One of the things that is new that um, changes the world of virtualization is that Docker was built for app dev. It was built by developers for developers, specifically tailored to their deployment methods. And it's even better at what we call full stack deployments, which is deploying applications as the infrastructure, operating system, configurations, uh, all of your dependencies and components, and your code. And really what we're trying to do here is to build consistency in our deployment and offer unlimited flexibility, which is something that is also very new. You can move from cloud to cloud. You can do things like microservices. Everything becomes a lot easier with container technology. <clears throat> so, Chris, let me just hop in with a quick question. When do you use containers? When do you use something else like virtualization, or, or do you use them together? Yeah, so I think that it, that's a very interesting question because there is an assumption. Uh, for the most part, your Docker engine is going to be running on a VM. Mm -hmm. You have the opportunity to run Docker on bare metal, and actually I think Sumo Logic's blog has a blog post specifically on this, but that's not the most typical. Development environments may run them locally, but even in a development environment, they're going to be using some virtualization to run on Docker. So in that case, they, they work hand in hand. In terms of using VMs as containers for a development flow, I do believe that Docker is really going to, really going to replace um, that, and uh, with the exception of maybe application backends, because okay. it does get a little different. 
when you talked about back end. Yeah. So despite the value in, in what we know about what containers can do for us, adoption has been limited. It's super popular, but adoption has been somewhat limited to the dev test processes, so the developers, machines, and applications are still being deployed to existing infrastructure in the cloud and, and virtual environments. And when you really dive into to the reasons why, um, first of all is we're fitting a new technology into existing organizations. So you just don't rip and replace. So you have to start somewhere, and development teams are much more flexible than than your production and environment. The other thing is this new performance, this new release process that we have um, comes with some new challenges because you are moving so quickly that it, it may be easy to get started and get going, but can you make sure that that speed is harnessed over a long period of time? And that's where management tools and log analysis comes in. And Really, you can blame the existing processes in the organization more than the technology. The technology is there. It's robust. There's a lot of things you can do. The, the third-party vendors that are providing tools around Docker are, are fantastic. Um, but not a lot of organizations are ready to embrace this new model of full-stack deployment. And in some, I've noticed, treat Docker containers just as they would a VM, where they deploy code directly to the same containers each time. So some of the barriers all break down into one key component, which is visibility. <clears throat> Docker is the big green go button. You hit the go button, you release your application. After you have released your application, what are some of the considerations you need to have to make sure that future releases are not hurt by the speed, this performance that I talked before. And those components are, are security. You know, security is a big question, especially when a lot of developers like to pull their initial images from the public Docker hub um, where you don't know who created these images. You don't know what versions of components are on there. So, um, if that accidentally gets into pro production, that could be an issue, as well as network security and the common security things we're used to. Integration, I'm talking about integration with your existing environment and your existing tools. You have more than one application. You have more than one backend. How are the Docker container technology going to fit with those? Because chances are you're not going to move your application 100% to Docker right away. Every application and organization is unique. There is not a one-size-fits-all uh, deployment, and I think that gets to part of the point today that, that um, there is a commonly accepted way of logging, but it's not the only way. And you need to have flexibility to work within your application. We have things called microservices, which splits your application into, you know, exponentially more applications and in, in components and parts. And Docker is probably the best way to deploy a microservices application, but also the, the management question gets many, many times more complex. And as I said, containers don't live in a silo. So all of this comes down to visibility, because the only way to address these questions, these concerns, these barriers is visibility, and the technology is there to do that, but you have to you have to be aware of that as a problem. You have to be aware that you actually want to specifically build an environment where you have as much visibility as possible. And then we have some organizational problems um, around ownership. Who owns Docker containers? Who is responsible for their setup? is always a question. In many environments, it's the developers, which means it never gets to production because production is IT ops uh, domain. And you have the existing people, process, and tools that you need to uh, integrate with. <clears throat> so I said that visibility is the most important thing to, to um, breach these challenges and these gates. And the thing with the container environment, there's not less data. There's more data. There is a lot more data. You have 
um, all the information from your host operating system, all the logs there, all the events there you have, all the data from the containers themselves, which there's many, many more objects now to collect data from, to monitor, and to, to visualize. <clears throat> uh, getting this data is, is one part of the challenge. Making sure, because collection of data is just one thing, making sure that it provides insights and values to it is another thing, which means you need visualizations, you need dashboards, you need um, pre-built and very useful uh, reports on your container environment. And finally, standard out is not the only option for logging. Uh, and actually maybe can be uh, limiting for some organizations. And you want to consider, you know, what you can do above and beyond that, especially because the Docker logs on themselves are not the entire picture. That's not the, all of the visibility. You have the cloud environment. You have your, your host operating system and your containers. So with that said, we're, we're very lucky today to have Faisal go in and do a deep dive uh, example of how you would actually bring this together and uh, execute on that. So I'm going to go ahead and hand it over to Faisal to, um, to, to do that for us. Thank you, Chris. Uh, so hi, folks. I'm going to talk about uh, logging on Docker and uh, the reason I think it's, it's a good idea to talk about that is that uh, when you a lot of a lot of uh, organizations want to move from you know to Docker, it's, it's a new thing, and it, it has a lot of promises to offer. But when you actually take it to production, there are a lot of challenges you got to you know you got to uh, overcome. So uh, this is built more on my experiences as we moved from you know, a traditional. Uh, production architecture to a Docker-based architecture, and I hope that some of the stuff that we learned along the way will help you when you uh, think about making that transition. And uh, so let's get started. Uh, so containers are, like like Chris said, containers are not new, right? But uh, for application packaging, it suddenly becomes a lot more attractive than it was earlier. I mean. We, it's not that, uh, for example, there were always times when you could download a network, you know, and a, and a virtual appliance, you know, from um, multiple uh, locations, and you could just, you know, if you wanted to deploy, um, let's say you want to deploy a MySQL server, um, you wouldn't, uh, you could just download a VM image of that and you know, run it. But what happens is that it's like a monolithic, monolithic thing. It sits there. It's, it's like a huge download. Um, uh, if you're if you don't have very good bandwidth, then you're going to end up spending a lot of time waiting for that to download. If there's an update to the image, to the image, then you got to wait for you know you got to download the whole new image all over again. So it's not really very efficient when it comes to distributing this, right? So Docker kind of takes uh, takes some of this pain away because of the way it's designed and the way it's packaged. So first of all, containers are, are, are designed. To, I mean, Docker especially, is, it's designed to distribute applications as a full container, as a full, uh, full stack of things. But it can, it can do deltas as well, and that makes it very attractive. Uh, you can think of containers or, uh, as, as a suit on steroids. If you've worked with Linux, you know that C suit is, you normally want to use C suit when you want to isolate an application or isolate a process, uh, primarily for security reasons. Uh, so, you know, it can't access things it's not supposed to access. And if it's ever breached, uh, the amount of damage it can do is limited. So, uh, Docker does that, plus it does a few more things that c root can't do. So, uh, Docker actually ships as uh, layers, uh, file system layers. So, it, it, it's stacked one on top of the other. And this... When you take all this together, you you put this under something called union file system. So you get a unified view of these layers put together. So the file system view that the application sees inside the container is a sum of these file system layers put together. So when Docker takes uh, an image of a container and brings it to life as a container, all it does is takes these images, puts them together, and then on top of that, it, sits, it puts a copy and write file system layer. And on top of that file system layer, your application runs with a limited view of what is inside this container. So 
when the application tries to make modifications to the to the image, the modifications reside only in the uh, copy or, or copy on drive file system layer. It doesn't make its way below that. So the, the images below that are completely intact. So let's say you want to you know destroy this container and start it again. All you have to do is remove the copy on drive file system layer on top, and you have a completely clean container. As you can just put new copy on file system on top, and you can start the application again, and you have a completely pristine container to work with. So that makes it very attractive when you go from uh, when when you want to deploy to production, you want to have your machines or applications run with as little state as possible. So if you can transition your application from a stateful application to a stateless application, that lets you scale very easily and very fast because you just got to bring this, this this image layer image layer to the box, put a copy of that file system on top, start the process, and you're good you're good to go. So. So when you start designing to scale, Docker becomes very attractive, especially when you when your application starts getting more and more stateless. So we just look at the just look at this quickly as how it actually compares with virtual machines. I know Chris already talked about that, but this is a quick uh, a deeper look at how uh, Docker compares to virtual machines. Right. So if you look at the picture on top, uh, you can see that uh, typically you'd use uh, virtual machines as 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 a full like it does, it's a virtual machine. Right? So it's got the extra guest server sitting over there. So you've got the hardware. You've got the hypervisor that actually, um, you know, it, it, um, uh, it switches between the running virtual machines. And then you actually have the full uh, operating system running inside an emulator. Right? So that is actually a lot of wasted CPU, in my opinion, because you have the full file system layer sitting there, the full network stack. Everything over there that it's, there are multiple copies of every single virtual machine that runs on the server. Uh, Docker does away with all of this. It gives you similar functionality. It gives you the container. It gives you the isolation that your application would like. So applications can talk to each other unless they are designed to talk to each other, uh, but without the extra guest operating system overhead. So when you run on the Docker, all your processes actually end up running on the, with the same kernel, uh, on the same machine using the same RAM, but they are but they are isolated from each other using kernel namespaces. So the Linux kernel has supported has recently added. Well, it's it's been there for a while, but this first time Docker has started leveraging it. That you can actually uh, isolate entire uh, classes of objects uh, into silos. So the file system, for example, is one such namespace. The network is another namespace, so you have your own independent namespace of uh, all the independent networking uh, stacks sitting over there, or actually the interface, and you have your own independent file system view. Without the extra overhead of having an extra OS sitting there to, you know, separate uh, access to these entities. So really, so, Faisal, this says that if your goal is just to isolate applications from one another, Docker is a much more efficient way of doing it. Definitely, definitely. Okay, thanks. And, and, it's, and it's got the added advantage of actually being able to do this efficiently, especially for file system mm -hmm. images. And that's not there with VMs, because if you had to do it with VMs, then you have to have, you know, full VMs had to be downloaded and installed, right? But with, uh, with Docker, you can share existing images. So, so if, you had, if you had an application, you had two containers on a VM, on, on Docker, that actually were built of Ubuntu, you know, 1404, for example. So the, it would actually share a lot of the, uh, the underlying uh, file system layers, and only the ones on top that you that, that actually contain your application changes would be different. So when you download it and it's ran these two containers, it would be much faster to do this using Docker than by using VMs. Yeah. So, uh, so why why Docker and you know why didn't you know virtual machines take over like uh, uh, you know the the uh, containerization uh, thing, right? So in my opinion, because uh, I think a lot of organizations, as they, as, at least in my opinion, in my experience, when, when we move from you know from uh, to cloud, um, um, we realize that you know as the application scales to a lot of machines, a lot of machines, right? It makes sense to uh, you know, break your application down into smaller entities called microservices, so that you can test this independently. Uh, they have less dependency on each other. And that makes it easier. That makes the application actually a lot more robust, right? So, and Docker kind of fits into this paradigm very nicely. It's designed to do exactly this. So, when you 
start scaling to cloud and, and large, large networks, Docker makes a lot of sense, right? And then the other thing that Docker does nicely is the ability to kind of, you know, it is you can publish your work that other people can use, which means there's a lot of, a lot of these uh, microservices sitting out there for you to use too. Let's say you wanted to run an app, you're running an application, and you decided that, you know, I need to have a, um, a cache layer sitting there. So I'm going to pull in Redis, for example. Now, if you are tradition, if you're doing it in you know, a traditional model, you need to figure, okay, where do I run this Redis? I need to bring up a new VM for Redis. Do I need to, you know, uh, configure it this way and things like that, right? But, uh, but with, with um, Docker, you can just, you know, go to the Docker registry, look for Redis, find one that fits your need, and just pull it. And if it's built on the same uh, OS that you're running, uh, that the rest of your application is on, you'd end up even sharing some of the, you know, the files and layers, so you wouldn't have done all the whole thing. So it's easy now to add new microservices to your, to your mix of um, programs that run that, 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 that define your application on multiple machines. So all of a sudden now you have this really nice tool that you could build large, scalable applications with. And I think that's what kind of transitioned. It's, it's really designed to work with the DevOps model. So developers can, you know, work with individual containers. They can find and design it. And the operations don't really have to worry about how those, app, uh, those applications fit together. Uh, they have a nice mechanism to put them all together and push it onto production. So this kind of is a – Docker is, is, is kind of a uh, – it's come at the right time when the company is looking to scale the, you know, the, the, the system of the cloud, for example. So with all of that uh, – Though Docker is really nice, it's got a downside as well. Uh, because your application is now a collection of microservices, the problem is at some point you're going to think that, you know, what's going on with the application? Something is wrong. Something, something fails, and you're, and you're left scratching your head trying to figure out what went wrong. So, uh, so insight into what the application is doing, especially at scale, becomes very, very important. Right? And then when you throw in this mix of uh, the application running multiple micro uh, microservices uh, from different sources, you have to worry about how it, 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 it informs you about its health. So most applications write log files telling you know what, what's going on and stuff like that. If you see an error, they'll, they'll emit lines to the log file saying that you know, something went wrong. But when you have different applications from different sources, the problem is that all the log files end up in different places. And Docker is designed to have its container as stateless as possible, which means that if your log files stay on the container, getting them out of the container is a very painful process. It's because it's designed for isolation, uh, it's not really easy to just walk in and take, take the logs out unless you let, let, let the application, let, let uh, the configuration do that. So uh, while Docker lets you, you know, scale out nicely and do much services, you've got to be careful when you design it so that you can actually get those logs out and use the information that you get from the logs to determine how, how, how your application is actually doing. Right. So at some, at some, at some level, uh, this becomes quite challenging uh, unless you have the right tools to the, to the job. So, so when you uh, now talk about, you know, if, if you think about moving to Docker, some things you need to really be careful about. Uh, one is that, you know, applications are going to spread across lots and lots of machines, which then means that uh, uh, if you need to monitor health uh, or determine if something has gone wrong or correlate events that occur across, uh, across machines, then you better have a way of taking, uh, you know, uh, getting your hands on the logs and then being able to even correlate entries, uh, things that happen on the logs. So for example, let's say the user logs into your servers, right? You end up with you know, a log entry in one of the servers saying that user so and so logged in. And then let's say the user's trying to access some data that sits on some other machine, some other uh, Docker container. Uh, that container is going to log some information about what that user did. Now, if something goes wrong along the way, you need to find out what happened. Uh, insights is now missing because the logs are lying on different machines. And if you want to figure what happened, you've got to log into the machines and, and, and look at the logs and try and figure out what's happening, right? So you have to have this. Is a, it, it becomes absolutely necessary, the, essential that you have a tool sitting on top that can take all your logs together and then be able to correlate what's going on between uh, during the entire life cycle of the user being on your network, right? So that becomes extremely important. In my, in my opinion, without having that in place, you can't think of uh, scaling out. Right? And uh, the other thing you have to be careful about is when, when, when application, uh, it's not just the application logs, uh, you also need to be 
taking care of your your um, your server health, right? Your the, the RAM is consuming, the CPU is consuming. Um, if you have no salt space left, uh, things like that, right? And you want to be able to do it at a, at a large, at, at a high level where you can look at the entire health of your cluster or of your, of your cloud and see that things are going right or wrong. And, and if you think you need to scale up, you need to have some metrics there in place, right? So uh, the logging and monitoring becomes an extremely important part of your scale, your scale uh, roadmap. Without that, you're probably going to be in a lot of trouble if you try to move to Docker without having this in place. It's not going to. It's not going to help you at all. Right. So uh, with that, we're going to try and look at what you can do with logs. Because logs, in my opinion, are like the. It's like it's like having a stethoscope, and if someone will, the doctor uses a stethoscope right, to figure what's going on uh, inside the body. Uh, you know, or to get them inside into that. Or maybe you'd want to have a, a scan of some kind. But with, with with applications in the cloud, logs are like your your insight into what's going on in your application, and. Um, Getting your hands on log in one place where you can analyze it is extremely important. So we look at how we can log using Docker, and what are the various strategies you can use to get these logs out somewhere where you can use it for further analysis. So the first of these um, is logging to a traditional application. If you move a traditional application, uh, they'll all want to. They, they'll most probably be logging to a, a log file. Right? Most applications are designed to log to files. So with Docker, let's see how you can do that. Uh, I'll come. I'll, I'll walk through the remaining uh, targets as well as we go down the presentation. Um, so the first way that the application sends log is to log files, right? So once you start, when you move your application to a container, the application will want to log to some place in the file system. But if you let that happen, it's going to happen inside the copy and write layer inside on, on Docker, which will eventually fill up, and then your uh, your your application will most probably crash. So you want to make sure that the logs that are written uh, don't exist inside the container, but they should be probably mapped somewhere outside the container. And you should, there, there should be some mechanism there that you can take those logs and send them off to a central server. So one way to do that is you can map a volume from one container into another container. So let's say you start a container with, you know, with some path marked as a volume. Uh, you can then say that when you launch another container, this is my first container's volumes as volumes inside my second container. So let's say your application logs to Verilog, and in this image, in the diagram, you can see that we have a log collector container, right? So it's it's got a volume defined as Verilog, and that when 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 you launch the application, uh, telling Docker to map the log container's volumes into the application, the Verilog gets mapped into Verilog inside the application. So when the application writes to the Verilog. Uh, volume, it actually ends up inside the log container's volume, right? And the log container can then just, you know, read through the logs that, it, that the application writes, and it can then send a copy of these logs to the logging server uh, where you might want to do more analysis or, you know, have alerts in place so if something goes wrong, you know, to take corrective action. And if you didn't want to actually keep those logs inside the log container itself, you could actually map the, the, the var log from the log container to some part on the Host file system. Uh, with that kind of model, you can uh, you can you can keep the log container itself very lightweight. Nothing is stored in the log container. All the data is stored on the on the host volume itself. Which means that the uh, you can then have some external tool cleaning up these logs periodically, or doing something else with these logs. So just like the easiest way to get logging working, is using a log container. The other way of doing that is. Uh, Logging to SCD. So, what do you mean the logging to SCD out? Uh, traditionally, applications would log to a log file, right? But Docker, uh, with Docker, when you start using it, you'll see that Docker recommends that applications log to the SCD out. Now, from a Docker's perspective, that's good because Docker can control what it does with the logs. Uh, but most applications, unless they're designed to work with Docker, they don't do this, right? Or it's very difficult to get them to log their actual logs to the standard output. So. If you if you have an application if you're writing an application designed for Docker then it's easy to do this. If you're not, it's enough to look at other ways of doing it. But if you can do that, then this becomes a, a lot more flexible with Docker and logging, because Docker can it, uh, can take care of logs uh, very nicely. So the other advantage of doc logging to SCD out is that uh, it's easy to write for. If you're an application uh, developer and you want to you know, write a log. You have to look for a logging object, just write to the standard output, and they'll appear in the logs at some point. Right? Uh, and uh, with, 
with respect to HD out, you have another advantage that uh, Docs can take care of uh, either storing it on the file or sending it to some other data store without the application having to change at all. So we look at another couple of these, uh, how, how this actually is, is done with Docker and its new logging driver mechanism. Uh, but for now, just keep this in mind. So, so this is an example of how uh, SD out logging to SD out actually works. So in this case, we have two containers, uh, one container running applications and another container running a single application. And all of them write their logs to SD out. Right? They just limit the logs to send out it. And Docker collects these logs. And depending on how it's configured, it stores it either into the uh, into a file or it can send it away somewhere else. Uh, by default, if you don't do anything with Docker, uh, Docker just takes all the standard output that comes from applications or from containers and goes straight into uh, a file in the form of JSON. So uh, you can always go back and examine these logs as long as the containers exist. And the logs and the containers are kind of tied together. When you destroy a container, the logs get destroyed as well. Uh, the other way that applications tend to log is to syslog. And this is very common because um, syslog has been around for many, many years. And uh, a lot of the applications that you will find that's already written will probably have support for syslog. So it means that if you didn't try to containerize these applications for your, uh, for your cloud, you need a way of getting the logs into a syslog and then actually sending them to your logging server in some way or the other. But uh, the way syslog is designed is that it makes it a little bit more difficult doing that on Docker. So we just look at the ways, some of the ways we can do this. So the first way of doing that is that you can run syslog uh, daemon on your host machine. So you set up a set up a virtual machine or a you know bare metal machine that runs Docker. You can run a copy of syslog on the machine itself. Um, and then what you do is you tell your containers that when you launch to actually uh, map the socket that the sub listens to uh, inside the container. So when the container application writes, writes the log, it actually ends up coming to the application running outside the container. So syslog by uh, on on, uh, on Linux normally uh, listens to a socket that runs on dev log. This is a Unix socket, so it's actually a part of the file system path. And when an application wants to log to syslog, it just writes this part, the socket path. And uh, syslog then takes a log. And then you can configure syslog to do what you want it to do. You can configure to write a uh, sort of copy on the local machine. You can configure to send it off to a remote machine. Or uh, you can do anything else you want with it. So syslog is very flexible that way. So that's, that's why it's been so popular uh, all these years. So this is how that actually looks in practice. Um, the Docker host, we have uh, running syslog on the, on, on the Docker host. So you see the do syslog daemon sitting over there. It is writing to via log and existing on dev log. So the way to, to get the, your container to log, to log to this daemon directly is to launch the container mapping dev log as dev log inside the container. So when the container is up, you can tell the Docker to take this, this file or this folder and map it to this location inside the container. So when the container starts up, uh, uh, that's available inside the container, from outside the container. So uh, in this case, the application just writes to, to syslog, which happens to be devlog, uh, and that's actually mapped to the uh, socket sitting outside the container. So all the logs come to the syslog daemon. The syslog daemon then, then can be configured to either write to var log or send it off on the network. So that's how you'd want, if you're running it on the host, uh, that's an easy way of doing it. The only downside to doing this is that uh, every machine that you bring up inside your cloud uh, that runs Docker, you also have to you also have to configure syslog and um, set that up correctly. So uh, this increases the amount of work you need to bring up a new machine. If you want to scale up, you want to bring out you know launch another ten machines. Each machine has to come up. Uh, you got to configure Docker, configure syslog, syslog on the on the server, and then you can start launching your containers. It doesn't become part of the orchestration mechanism, the orchestration tool that you need that you use. So the orchestration tools that you use will, will have a, a big say in uh, how your architecture, how you're going to design your architecture around logging. So sometimes it's easy to do, you know, something they to do within containers, something they use outside of containers. Mm -hmm. So if your orchestration tool doesn't support it, then uh, you have to you have to 
re-architect your container or your launch mechanism somehow so that your logs are available to the uh, logging process. So the other way that you can run syslog is inside a container. Instead of running it on the host machine, you run you move syslog into a container itself. And this kind of becomes very attractive because it's just another container then, you know. And if you want to change the syslog implementation, you can just change that. And as long as the interface to the container stays the same, you don't really care what syslog process you're running inside, right? So that abstracts away the syslog uh, implementation to just another container and part of your orchestration mechanism. So to go to scale anyway, you have to have something in place to you know, organize all your containers together into you know, running on specific machines or having this many containers running on this, on this specific machine. Uh, so if you have that, that, that um, infrastructure in place already, it becomes easy to do this as just one more container to run on your machine. Right. So how do you end up doing, how, do you, how can you use uh, your syslog running inside a container to actually log data from other containers? Right. The way to do that is that you have to launch the container, your syslog, your logging container first. And that's all important. The other thing you have to do is you have to tell the logging container, the, the syslog running inside the logging container, that you don't, you're not supposed to log, write your, create your socket on dev log, but create it some other, in some other location. And that location, you kind of map it outside of the container. So what happens is when, when, when you launch a container with a mapped volume, and syslog uh, creates a socket on that vo in that volume, that socket actually ends up being outside of the container, where it's visible to other containers if you choose to let them see it. And then when you launch the, the other containers that want to use syslog, you map this socket into devlog, into each container. So when the application inside the container writes to devlog, it ends up uh, actually writing to the uh, socket that ends up, uh, the data then ends up being uh, going to the uh, logger daemon running inside the logging container. Right. So this is how it, it looks like if you, yeah. So as you can see that we, we now have, um, you know, we have two application containers running here. We have uh, uh, a logger container running, so stock container running there. And then when we launch the stock container, we actually launched it with mapping two volumes outside of the container. So the sum path log outside the container is mapped to slash logger log inside the container. And uh, var log, slash var slash log is mapped to slash var slash log inside the container. So we launched the syslog container first. Syslog comes up, you instruct the syslog to actually put its log, the, the, the logging socket, the listening socket, on slash logger slash log, slash logger slash log. Uh, when it does that, when you create the socket over there, it actually ends up being on some log, some path log outside of the container. And now when we launch the remaining application containers, all we need to do is say map some path log to dev log inside the container. So as the application is concerned is writing to dev log, but actually the logs end up going to the uh, socket lying outside the container and then through that into the into, into the syslog even running inside the container. And that can be then configured to do whatever you want. You could write to dev log, var log, which would end up being on var log on the host, or you could send the logs to the network logger, and uh, you're good to go. So this becomes just one more container to run on your Docker machine. So if you have to create a, a VM or a machine that just does it, it does it in this mechanism, it's just simple. You create the base, you know, a VM with the base OS, install Docker, and you're good to go. Okay. Yeah, and the now, uh, this is, so, till recently, Docker had a problem with uh, logging. I mean, it did just did JSON files. And then you had to do all this muck to get the docs out of the container. Uh, but recently, Docker started supporting a bunch of backend uh, logging drivers. So that makes it a lot more attractive now to start, you know, port your applications to start logging to SSD out. So if you can send your logs to SSD out, then Docker can send your logs wherever you want to go without you changing anything in the application. And that becomes very nice from an operations perspective. Um, let's say you, you know, you're testing something, you don't want to dirty the you know, production logs, you can send those logs somewhere else. There's another server, you can analyze it somewhere else. And then when you're, you know, you think it's good to go, you can pipe it back to the production server and stuff. Um, <clears throat> there may be times when you want to run, um, you have, you know, running on, on an operating system that actually support uh, things like system log, uh, sorry, um, system for example and you want your logs to go there instead. So, you know, 
it's, it's nice to have that feature if uh, the application can write to this layout. out. Okay, so we'll, we'll, uh, I won't be going into the details of um, the logging driver, but this is a quick overview on what happens when you log, use a logging driver. So let's say you start an application with your with a, the custom logging driver. Uh, here we have application one and application two running inside one container, and it's writing to uh, we launched it with the logging driver set to a log I mean, to one of the network logging drivers. Right. So all the application, all the container output actually goes uh, via SCD out. It goes to the Docker daemon. The Docker daemon, looking at the configuration, will then send the the logs to the log server, right? And application three is also launched by the same Docker, but when you launch it, we you know you tell it not to actually use the logging driver, but use default logging driver, which is JSON, and then it goes straight to the container storage path. So you can then customize how the logs are transferred, where the logs are sent, because the Docker knows what to do with it. So it, it's actually a lot easier to use it because it's, it's not less complicated. Uh, it's just a one one extra parameter to pass to Docker when you launch the container. So uh, moving your application to standard output is actually um, uh, is very attractive uh, when you see the best input from that. So this is an example of how to, if you're using the logging driver, how you'd launch your container. Um, uh, so let's say you want to use a slog for your logging driver without having to run your own syslog server. Let's, have a, let's say you have a syslog server running on your network that already does log analysis and stuff. And you just want to launch a couple of containers that log to that uh, that server. So with the logging driver support, uh, you just got to add a couple of command and options saying that, you know, send my logs to this host on this port using UDP or TCP, and your logs go off there. So using the logging driver is very easy. Uh, and I'm, 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 I think that uh, it, it's also easy to extend this support to multiple backends. So, if you uh, if you have uh, very specific backends you want to log your data into or log your logs into, then it's not very difficult writing up a logging driver. Um, yeah, I, I think that's about all I have uh, in terms of uh, um, Docker and logs. Um, this is this is the tip of the iceberg actually because. Uh, depending a lot on what you what you want to do with your containers, how you architect the system, um, uh, you'll have to make a lot of decisions about what what logging can be to use. In the end, you should I think the the objective is to try to get all your logs in one place uh, to a system that actually can actually analyze this data, and then you can do uh, you know uh, do things like uh, uh, you know notify somebody if something goes wrong or take corrective action if something goes down. And that should be the, the actual aim of you know, getting all the logs in one place and, and doing things with it. So that's all I have for now. Thank you. Thank you, Faisal. Um, to wrap things up, we'll, we'll hand it back to Chris with some uh, closing thoughts. Chris? Thank you. And thanks, Faisal. Uh, that was a great deep dive in, into the various options. And they're listed here uh, again, and I don't need to iterate them, but the the point is that you, you have options, and options come with um, the fact that you need to build a strategy. So you can't just um, expect that standard out is going to do the job for you. You need to find the right tools um, and the right processes, and you need to know what you want to get out of these logs. Logging for the sake of logging is not going to do a lot for you. Right. Um, so you need to really try to extract the value. And so, really, what we want to do here is take Docker from go beyond dev test. And we want to say, you know, we can finally use Docker as a production level solution and really expand out what our development pipeline um, can do and then move on to, to a lot more interesting opportunities that it affords us. Um, to do that, you want to find tools that have built a specific Docker um, functionality. So they've they've tooled, they've they've built integrations, they've made considerations around Docker uh, specifically. You want a tool that a log analysis tool that supports the model of your choice. So if you're if you're just locked into one model, then 
that's where the tool dictates how you do things versus you um, building the system and taking control of your environment, which is very important from a change control perspective and looking into the future of, of doing other things. And a nice way to do that with a log analysis tool is to find one that has pre-built dashboards and alerting systems. And some of the examples that I, I like is that you should be able to report on the top 10 consumers um, uh, in your environment. Especially in microservices, you have so many containers out there. This not only benefits your operation, this actually benefits from an application architecture standpoint because you can understand, you know, which of your services are, are consuming the most resources. You want to be able to do things like container detection, detection on create and delete actions, and container actions, period. The reason for that is that um, there may be various reasons that containers get created, and there's a lot, even in container environments, there's those snowflake-type instances where somebody needs to maybe test something new and so forth. And without knowing what's going on and what these actions are, you end up into container sprawl. And container sprawl uh, not only poses security risk because there's containers out there that can be outdated, it also uh, hits the bottom line <laughs> because if you're any cloud infrastructure, you're paying for those resources, even if they're used or not used. So you want to make sure that that you can trim unused containers and uh, know what's going on there. And that all comes down to visibility. And then finally, containers, the base um, of any container is an image. And most organizations and the best practices is for them to create their own images, whether they're based on an existing one or not. You also need to know what your, where and what your image uh, library is and what's on those images, um, because that's where you're going to decide if, uh, heaven forbid, you got uh, Heartbleed introduced into one of your primary containers. Again, i do not not sure why it would ha happen, but name your own example. You can spot that and, and address the issue and make sure that that uh, image does not propagate into future releases. All of this comes down to the expansion of your Docker environment, um, healthy adoption, adoption in a way that's not going to destroy um, your pipeline and your infrastructure, sustainable environments, um, avoiding container straw, sprawl. One thing I didn't mention is that ops, with, with good logging and log analysis, ops can bless a Docker environment without interfering from the developer's ability to use it, and it, it at the end of the day, it's going to give you better application quality and better security. So it's not just operation. We need to realize that it actually feeds back into what the developers do as well. So um, I'm going to turn it back over to Michael, and I think that we can address some of the, the questions that may have come up. Terrific. And um, for those of you who are viewing the recording of this, you can, you can uh, submit your questions as well, and we'll get you an answer via email. So um, don't hesitate if you've had a question. First of all, Faisal, Chris, I want to thank you both for the 30,000-foot um, the view and for the deep dive, um, really, to take a look at how, how to take advantage and really turn these log uh, files into action um, so they become meaningful and, and can actually help the business with all this information. And I uh, also want to thank our sponsor, Sumo Logic, for uh, bringing us today's event. They are offering a free trial for their, for their tool. You can find that by clicking on the Attachments tab. You'll see a link to that trial. Now, a couple of the questions. Faisal, let me um, start off with um, you. You talked about an orchestration tool. you want to go a little more detail into what that actually means? Yeah, yeah. Uh, thanks, Michael. Uh, yeah, so so one thing that um, that you have to have when you you know you know, science of scale is something that tells your Docker VMs that you know these are the containers I want to run, right? So that kind of becomes a very important part of how you design and uh, scale your application. Uh, it also determines a lot about determines a lot of um, uh, how your application will. You know, it will, will, will scale up, scale down uh, dynamically. So the orchestration tool, uh, one of the things you're looking for when you do that is uh, is the ability to actually get input 
from some analysis to know when it's time to scale your uh, servers out and to know when you, it's time to, you know, bring them down, the loads gone down, or, you know, things like that. So uh, examples include uh, you could have things like uh, Kubernetes or, um, you know, Salt Stack or Shares Puppet, whatever else you need that you use in the organization. Uh, pay close attention to how well it supports Docker. And if you already are using it, chances are that, you know, the ops people won't be, uh, you know, if you could get that, get them to use, uh, get that tool to, you know, do orchestrating with Docker, then you've, um, then you already have buy-in with the operations folks because you know how to use a tool. And it's become very important, uh, when you, you make, when, you, when you're trying to move from a non-Dockerized environment to a Dockerized environment. Thanks for that. Thanks. You know, Chris, we talked about um, support for application backends, uh, but we, we didn't really go into that. Can you talk a little bit about Docker support for different application backends? Yeah, and I think that Faisal will be able to jump in on this one as well. Um, one of the things about Docker and it being lightweight and um, and really one of the the key tenants is that the flexibility. That, that contradicts a little bit what we see when we, when we look at um, backend. So your backend application and deploying your backend, um, which is not as frequent and you may not be doing full stack deployments as you would with front end. Um, right. so in, it's a, it's an important consideration that organizations need to take into account. What I see mostly today is that, um, deployments with Docker are the, the front end applications and, and the services, um, but not so much the back end um, due to the the more robust infrastructure requirements that are there. Okay, great. Faisal, did you have something you wanted to add to that? Um, uh, no, I think he's covered that. Um, yeah. Okay, great. Thanks. Um, we, we don't have much time. Let me wrap up with this last question, Chris. How do you manage all of these Docker images? What's the best way to do that? So management comes down to one thing is who's managing it. I think mm -hmm. that um, part of the key from an organizational standpoint is that there isn't fiefdoms, there isn't barriers. These, these visualizations and dashboards we talked about, the tool might be under the control of IT ops and they might determine what the dashboards are, but the visibility into them should be for everybody, and that really helps the development team. Even the QA team address issues faster and support a healthy uh, environment without a lot of uh, needless communication um, back and forth. And then management of, of the containers itself, it, it, um, you know, it requires several components. It requires a robust uh, log analysis for, for visibility. It requires... A, pi a private uh, hub for your images. This is also uh, very important. You can't just um, base your images. It, uh, it would be irresponsible to base your images off of the public um, uh, hub and, and manage the images there. And then you also have the creation of the images. There needs to be a system for vetting and creating these images and making sure that they're consistent, that each developer is not working with a different image, which all comes down to really defining your process and your strategy. It's not necessarily a technology problem. Um, so you need to have, you need to spend some effort on that. One of the things that that is in the nature of developers is to grab a tool and start using it. But when you consider the entire environment and pipeline, there's there's some more things to consider. When you grab yeah, a I, I agree with Chris that. Yeah. Go ahead. And, and I agree with Chris there with that. Uh, sorry. I agree with Chris with that uh, about that because uh, what, you, uh, what you typically end up doing is when you're you know, deploying to Docker the first time is that, you know, you bring up a local registry with, you know, to store your images. And then as time goes by, you'll find that, you know, a lot of people are putting things in it. So you need to have some kind of tool that, you know, to control your registry, you have more visibility into what goes into the into your registry. And then um, the other thing that you have to then end up worrying about is scale when you're, you know, you said, you know, you're trying to launch your, push your, you know, application to 100 different machines at the same time. Uh, you, if you, you don't really want to send your data to, to Docker's own registries because, you know, you have privacy you know, issues there. 
but you want to be able to scale your registry server itself so that the applications, when they get pushed to the nodes, they don't really take your registry server down at the same time. So all of these things, you know, uh, add to your decision when you go towards Docker, and it's kind of very important, like Chris said, to keep in, you know, it's not just, you know, putting, getting containers running them, but all the things need to be taken care of. Um, yeah, that's all. And with that, we've run out of time. I want to thank our speakers today, Chris Riley, Vaisal Puttaparakat, for their great presentation. Also, I want to thank today's sponsor, Sumo Logic, and remind you that you can get a free trial. Just click on the attachments link. You will see the link to that free trial of their tool when you get there. Uh, thanks for attending today. For Slash.media, this is Michael Krieger. Have a great day.